Um, okay, last up is um, Kath Adams, senior psychologist from John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle, and Kath's going to present integrating a multidisciplinary stepped care model of psychosocial care for cancer survivors and families into routine clinical practice in rural and remote regions. Kath. Thanks, team. $20 is yours, Douglas. I'd just like to say that title wasn't all mine. Um, I guess it's been said often enough so far today, but the bucket's empty. There's no more money to be had in the current climate. And so if we're really going to provide adequate, timely, appropriate psychosocial intervention, we just need to change the way we manage our workload and the way we refer patients. So, before I get into the project, I need to acknowledge the fact that within Hunter New England, we're very fortunate in that we have a psycho-oncology clinical stream that's part of the cancer services stream. Um, I recognise that all local health districts aren't that lucky, and certainly the support that we get from the Cancer Services Directorate has made all of this work possible. I always go over time, so I'm doing the important things first. Um, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who've been involved. This project wouldn't have worked without Deanna Sue, who's the con clinical nurse consultant that I work with in psycho-oncology, and she's the most organised person in the world. I am her antithesis. The social workers that we worked with, um, Fiona in Armidale, Jan in Moree, Judith in Tari, and Lee in Tamworth. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the psycho-oncology positions that exist within the area. Our fearless leader, Brian Kelly, who's the um, stream director for the clinical psycho-oncology stream. The cancer directorate people who are nearly all here in the room, all here in the room. Um, but particularly all of the staff, the volunteers, the GPs, the practice nurses, and all of the interested parties who participated in this project and were part of developing the model of care that I'm going to talk to you about. So thanks to Judy, you all know about Hunter New England. <laughs> um, we are very conscious in our local health district of the tyranny of distance. We have the combination of that and know the, the knowledge that there's no new resources. We recognise that typically rural areas have high levels of generalist support across the board, but particularly in psychosocial support, but poor levels of specialist support. So within, within the Hunter New England, the dedicated psycho-oncology social work positions that exist are the, the four people that I've mentioned, and they're actually three full-time equivalent positions, so Tari, Tamworth, Moree um, and Armidale. There are no dedicated clinical psychology or psychiatry positions outside of Newcastle. Um, so that, that already you can see the disparity in the availability of specialist services. So what we were looking at is how we could introduce a model of care that was generic across the area but could be localised to the specific networks. We recognised it was crucial to involve all of the local members and so we really did start this project from the ground up. We looked at the model of care within the psycho-oncology clinical stream and we haven't reinvented the wheel, we've built on other people's work, um, but that was actually accepted by the stream before we then went out and built the networks. Um, also the the need to develop strong relationships. Um, and we've, we've worked particularly hard to try and identify all of the people across the networks who might be involved in psychosocial care. Um, we're conscious of the fact that a lot of those people are quite isolated. There's a lot of sole practitioners. And so part of this project was also looking at how we could provide support for those people across um, the district so that the supporters were actually being supported in their service provision. So the steps care model. What is it? It basically looks at allowing you to tailor the intervention to the level of potential need for each patient. And it might be a cancer patient, it could be their care, it could be a family member. And it involves the steps of identification. So you can see that universal care down the bottom, that covers everybody. All patients with cancer and their supporters should, should receive universal care. When you step up the model, you're looking at people that have higher levels of emotional or psychosocial distress, often higher levels of support needs. And at the top level, we have the people with severe or moderate 
levels of distress who need quite specialised psychosocial intervention. So the aim behind it is firstly to identify patients' need. Um, we use the distress thermometer. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. It's really important to remember the basis of this model isn't screening. Screening is a process, it's not an outcome. Screening people and finding out whether or not they're distressed isn't the end point, it's just the beginning. And so this model is about how do I then make sure the people that end up in these different tiers receive the care that they need. So we were having to look at the full range of existing resources, recognising that the same patient can step up and down through this model during their journey. So assessment and monitoring are really important. It's not a one-off thing. Um, as I said, we haven't reinvented the wheel. This work's been around for a while. What we've done is tried to build on some work that came out of the Western Australian model of psychosocial care. And that's how we've developed our generic model. And I apologise that it's tiny and you can't read any of it. But basically, this pathway steps you through the pyramid. So all patients diagnosed with cancer are receiving universal care at the point of entry to the cancer journey. So often the GPs are that point of entry and so it's been really important to try and involve them. The generic pathway talks about what universal care is and then steps down to the patients that are identified as distressed. So for the distress thermometer that's a score of four or above. There's a level of triage that exists within here, so you're identifying the patients that actually then may need a psychosocial care plan. And if they do, you're then again triaging what level of care they need. The most important thing, as I said, is this is not a static process, it's a living process, and it's important that there's repeat assessment throughout the person's journey so that we keep checking in with people and looking at how they're doing. Um, Got too many buttons to push. So the aims of the project, it came out of the psycho-oncology stream recognising firstly that we needed a model of care, that we were, we were all providing care but in slightly different ways and not necessarily for the patient that wasn't adding to their sense of consistency when they went back home or when they came to visit the major cancer centres. So we decided on accepting this tiered model but then looking at how we could localise it so it actually related to the people in the hometown of the patient. We made it very clear that we were using existing resources. We began all of our conversations with the bucket is empty. There's no promise of extra resources in this at all, but we need to talk about the resources we've got and how we can better use them. We did try to use the psychosocial care matrix, which is an evaluated tool um, to look at psychosocial care provision, but it just was too confusing for the people that we were talking to. So, you know, we gave up on that. <laughs> Um, and I wouldn't try using it for that reason. We were particularly interested in looking at improving access for the high priority populations and particularly for our Aboriginal populations. And recognising, again, the isolation of the healthcare professionals from support and training, we actually asked them what sort of training they'd like and what sort of support from us and built the plan around that. We also wanted to look at developing the service pathways that actually allowed people working with cancer patients and their families to identify how and where this person can get the help they need when they need it. Um, we've also been looking at, at using technology and iPads and how we can use them to increase face-to-face -face contact, both in terms of patient to doctor, patient to clinician, patient to counsellor, patient to psychologist, um, patient to family and also using them for clinical supervision. So providing individual supervision with people, um, using Scopia, so it's a, it's a secure um, voice uh, video conference. That, that's still in the developmental processes. Um, we, we are particularly concerned, as I said, with the, with the local um, Aboriginal people and, and the distant Aboriginal people. And our health district is very much looking at every way we can um, to close the gap. And as, as I said to someone the other day who was questioning why we needed to have that framework, you know, if you don't see why we desperately need to close the gap, just try jumping it. The method that we used, we identified the local networks and they were based on the clusters, which were in Judy's map and I'll show you again in a minute. We did 
organise workshops in Armidale and Taree. We were hoping to have workshops in Moree and um, Musselbrook. They haven't happened yet and I'll talk a little bit about why. We had the communication skills and effective partnerships training in Tamworth. So we really made an effort to go to the areas um, and that's something that often I think we forget to do when we're working with people that come from a different area is the importance of going to visit them and particularly for colleagues working in rural and remote areas, it's really important to actually say, well, look, we'll come to you. It's not that hard. Um, considering that we, we've known for some time, I mean, Tamworth did a, a project probably 15 years ago with Louise Shepherd out of Prince of Wales looking at clinical supervision using video conferencing. We know that that works. Um, so it, it made sense to try and build on that. With gynae oncology, we do consultations to the distant areas as well. So we knew that telehealth worked. Just trying to look at how we can increase that ease of access into the home or into the office. So here's the map again. The red circles are the places that we base, that there's a person that's looking after the network is based. So you can see Moree, it's actually seven hours when you drive to the speed limit, Jude. <laughs> no comment. But <laughs> and they, they, it's not very clear there, but they have um, a half-time social worker and a medical oncologist who visits from Tamworth. Armidale is four and a half hours from Newcastle, where the major treatment centres are. Um, they have a, a half-time social worker and their oncology... Um, medical and, oncol and radiation oncology services are private. They come from North Royal North Shore, private. Tamworth has a regional cancer centre and that has made a huge difference to service provision. They have one full-time social worker, haematology, medical and radiation oncology on site, no psychology, no psychiatry, no physiotherapy. <laughs> um, Tari is two hours away. They have one full-time social worker and a medical oncologist on site, and Musselbrook is um, an hour and 40 minutes away, so this is Musselbrook. They have no social worker. Medical oncology support is from both Newcastle and, and Tamworth. So it's all different. It's all a little bit confusing, um, probably more so for the people that <laughs> live in those areas. So what we did, we, we organised the network meeting. So of the two that we had, one was in um, Armidale, that was the first one, and then we had one in Taree. We had... 57 people attend, and they included the local social workers, cancer care coordinators, oncology nurses, GP practice nurses, GPs, support group leaders, the Cancer Council came, um, other NGOs, private practitioners in the local areas, and, and some of the local charities. Um, as you can see, everyone, sorry, everyone talked about the, um, the increase in knowledge that they gained about the local services. It was really interesting to have all of the people from the local area in the winery room going, oh, I didn't know you did that. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, so can we access that? So that was a really useful exercise in itself. The fact that at the end of it, fewer people felt very confident about making a referral, we actually took as a positive thing because there was a bit of overconfidence about how easy it would be to accept, access these services if you needed to. It was perhaps a little distressing when we talked to people about how they managed the higher levels of, of need and the people that needed specialised care. Oh, oh, we just call CLSI and so what happens then? Oh, I don't know. So there was a disconnect for the people at the top level. Um, of the people that attended, 15 of them were using telehealth. Nine of them said that they would now use it. So that, again, I think that was a good outcome. The four that said they wouldn't were because Two of them were practice nurses and didn't say it was part of their role. Um, one of them didn't have access to the technology and one of them just wouldn't try. <laughs> um, it was interesting, the main outcome from the meeting was the GPs pushing for service directories and when we talked about the fact that the Cancer Council had a service directory and that Can Refer exists, they were very dismissive of those facts and saw them, they saw them very much as top-down things. So these directories were put together and then, you know, other people had to put the information in and make it right. And, and I know myself, I'm apparently a member of the colorectal multidisciplinary team at Gosford Hospital, according to Can Refer. Oh, I didn't know that. But <laughs> um, as far as the professional development went, we ran a workshop um, where we had J Janet Vickers, who's the head of social work for family and community services on the Central Coast, come and talk about effective partnerships. She was awesome. She's actually managed to get... Um, DACs or FACs 
and juvenile justice and the police service working together. And one of the things that she highlighted was, instead of sitting in our silos looking at how we can build partnerships, let's step into the middle of the room and look at what we can achieve together. That was a very positive outcome and I think um, particularly for the Northwest Cancer Centre, which is a new service, it really helped them look at how they could be supporting each other, particularly through chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So that was good. Um, the communication skills we had Stuart done, so of course it was fantastic. It was slightly different in that we had all different disciplines within the room and the, it was following one patient through their journey and one of the most um, positive things that came out of that was different disciplines realising how much more power they had to work with their colleagues rather than, you know, seeing patients in a lineal progression. Um, so particularly the care coordinators and the social workers actually sitting in and practising working with the patient together, they found that very positive. The service directories are still at different stages, okay, and this is what the GPs wanted. We, we went there thinking we would be developing pathways that they were at that point and they weren't. They just wanted to know who they could refer to where. So this is an example, and again, I apologise for its size, of what we sent back to Armadale. We filled in what, what we talked about on the evening. We filled in some generic, you know, um, Leukaemia Foundation Men's Shed Camp quality, things that exist across the area but also some specific services within the hospital, within the private practice world, and what they could do to access those high-level service needs. So looking at telehealth using Scopia, touching in with the CL Psychiatry um, teleconferencing system that we use. We sent that back to them, and the, the social worker from Armadale actually couldn't make it on the night, which was a great disappointment. But the outcome from that is that the local charity who did make it on the night are supporting the development of a website and have taken on the championship of owning the website and making the changes and updating it. And that's something that we've really pushed as well. You know, we'll help develop the networks, but someone in the area has to be responsible for keeping them up to date. Um, again, getting the service directories together is a process, not an outcome. It's an ongoing thing. It needs to, to keep being reviewed. In terms of reactions and how people responded to it, it was the, the reactions were very positive. We built a lot of new partnerships, I think. It was very difficult to get the GPs to attend, but they're flat out, you know. Um, from the Tari workshop, we invited 76 GPs. Five of them said they were coming, one turned up, and, and one comment that was made twice by participants was, it'd be nice if you involved the GPs. <laughs> yep, we tried. <laughs> so what we've found from that, by, by then going back to the GPs and talking to them, is what they want is a draft service directory. They'll comment on that. They, they want a useful tool. They don't want to waste time talking about what it might look like. And I can understand that. The point of entry screening is hard, and I don't know that the stress screening isn't actually providing a barrier to implementing psychosocial care, and I think this is something across the board we need to discuss. Does, does using a tool like the distress thermometer give us more than just encouraging people to ask the patients how they're going? Does it put a barrier in place? Does it add an extra step that's just too hard? Um, something else to remember. I think some of the advantages with what we've done is everyone can see what, what they own and they can see what they've contributed to, but they can also see that they benefit from the whole process and that it benefits across the area. Um, we have had good buy-in from the people that attended and we are intending to provide ongoing support. One of the difficulties that we have is the Deanna's position and my position is not recurrently funded, so we have to really work hard by next November to make sure that it's, it's integrated and accepted. Um, the generic model of care and service pathway, I think, are very widely applicable, and I think it's something that could easily be rolled out across the state. In terms of our future goals, the first one's always been a personal goal of mine, um, <laughs> but we might just start with the local health area and perhaps moving on to the state. We are working, we're hoping to work with um, the Birupai Aboriginal Health Service in Taree, um, one of their nurses came and attended our night at Tari and, and asked a couple of questions and said it's the first time I've ever attended something that I felt comfortable enough to ask questions and talk at. So we thought that was a really positive thing. We're working to tie it in with the healthcare pathways that um, Hunter, Hunter Urban Medicare Local has. Um, and they're basically a screen that the GP can pull up that tells them if they suspect this, they do the following things. So just putting ours into that same format. Um, 
We've got amended drafts out to all of the networks in terms of their service directories and we're getting feedback on those. We're also introducing monthly supervision learning sessions via telehealth, which is something that the staff have really responded to well and that's not something that costs us anything to do. We do recognise the need to take it step by step and make use of opportunities as they arise. Um, and so the monthly learning sessions were actually originally just supervision sessions, but staff expressed an interest in learning a bit more, so that's what we're doing with them. Um, we're confident that the networks will continue um, and that patient access to appropriate and timely services will continue to improve. We recognise it does take effort, but we have seen acceptance from all of the different networks that we've established that if everyone does their little bit, the whole will be better and patient care will be more consistent and better for everyone across the area. That's the end. Thanks for listening. Happy Friday afternoon. <laughs>